Now, starting with the model's running gear, like I mentioned before, the gearbox was swapped out with the steel ball bearing gearbox from Tegan. From the gearbox, this now takes us to the sprocket and the idlers. The original model featured these components in plastic, and these were replaced with the metal variants because the track was also swapped out as well. If you are upgrading a 116 scale RTR model, whether it's a Henlong, Tegan, Sherman, Tiger, Bulldog, what have you, if you're replacing the plastic track with metal track, you're also going to need to change out the sprocket as well. The idler, the jury's out on that, depending on how much you run the vehicle as well as the road wheels, but the sprocket is definitely something that is going to need to be replaced simply due to the amount of wear that the metal tracks exhibit on this component here. Now the sprockets are the Tegan units and these are the late production Tiger options that are supplied by Tegan. The difference of course between the early Tiger and the late Tiger has to do with the center hub. The earlier Tigers utilize a dome for the hubcap appearance that has the lug nuts on it while on the later Tigers the sprocket was redesigned and the sprocket face is flat and has this type of hub that we have here. Now on the Tegan model the hub is mounted or I should say the sprocket is mounted to the spindle via a single fastener that's found in the center. This is true for the Tamias and all the other 116 scale tanks as well. And this is again utilizing that of a metric fastener. The fasteners and the lock washers are included with these sets and were simply just dropped in. However, one little tip that I recommend is I utilize blue Loctite on these fasteners just to keep them from backing and working themselves loose while the tank is in operation. Now I utilize blue Loctite because in case you ever have to remove the sprocket for whatever reason, the blue Loctite will, will, bond will snap before you can possibly strip out the fastener. Now, the detail hub that we have here is the stock unit and was mounted in place with a little drop of Elmer's glue was all it's used to keep the piece on. The reason for that is you don't want to have the piece on with any sort of a more permanent type of adhesive like CA or something along those lines because, again, if you ever have to get access to this piece, removal of this hubcap here can be problematic if the piece is held on with a very strong epoxy or super glue. Also, you don't want to just rely on friction alone as during the tank's operation or if you're driving off-road, this piece can easily wobble out on you and then you're basically trying to track down a replacement or trying to track down the original piece which is in the grass somewhere, which is not a really fun way to spend your evening. Moving from the sprocket now brings us to the tank's rear idler wheel. Now, like I said before, the original one was plastic and was swapped out for this metal unit. Now, the idler and sprocket typically come in a set if you buy them from takingtanks.com or if you purchase them from some other supplier or online retailer. The sprockets generally come with their rear idler wheels present. Now, like I said before, this is the late production set. In addition to giving you the late production sprocket, it also gives you the late production rear idler. The difference, of course, being is that on the Tiger One, the early production idler was considerably larger in size. One of the key traits of the later production units was that the idler wheel's circumference was diminished and the wheel is considerably smaller. Now, in addition to the wheel, when it came time for installation, I was able to take the wheel, disassemble it further, and I was able to take some grease and lubricate the axle that the wheel will spin on. This is a, a feature that I do on my builds as it does help prolong the life and reduce the wear of these components. If we notice on the sprocket, or I should say on the rear idler itself, you'll notice the hubcap detailing. This is not present with the stock Tegan sets, and the unit that we have here is the Resin set from EastCoastArmory.com. The Resin set is a drop-in installation, and the rear idler wheels are ready. You just take the ECA set, add some drops of glue, and mount it to the receptacle that is integrally molded onto the rear idler wheel thus giving you the detailing which is normally absent on the stock units. Moving from the rear idler now brings us to the model's road wheels. The road wheels that you see on this vehicle here are totally stock and are not altered in any way. From the wheels this now brings us to the tank's track. Now the track on the model like I said has been replaced from the kit original which was a late pattern track but it was in plastic. The metal track is the Tegan 
track and the Taken track is superb. It has fantastic detailing on its track face. If you notice, this is a late pattern Tiger One track because of the ice cleats that are found on the main traction bar. As well as on the teeth, you'll notice that they have the little segments hollowed out for the mud slits. This is a nice feature which is found exclusively on the Tegan models and are absent on such vehicles as the Tamiya as well as the Matto tanks as well. Also, one thing I like about the Tegan track is that the hinge of the track, if I could get it in frame here, here we go. The hinge is completely sealed off and are not open like they are found on the Tamiya and also on the Henlongs. Of the aftermarket 116 scale tracks that are on the on the market available to customers, the Tegan track is definitely the best one in my opinion. Moving from the suspension now brings us to this lower front portion here of the armor plate. Now on the stock model, this section here is missing its Zamurai coating. The coating that you see here was sculpted by myself with red putty and was made to blend in with the remainder of the Zemrite, which on this model here are consisting of vinyl strips. The same was also applied to the rear section of the armor plate as well. Moving from the rear armor plate now brings us to the tow hitch. Just like I frequently mentioned on these Tegan rebuild videos, the tow hitch is molded solid and a quick little modification to make to improve the look is with a Dremel or a pin vise, you drill out the section in the center for the tow pin. Now moving on from the tow hitch brings us to the tank's exhaust manifold. Now the manifold on this model here has been replaced from the stock original. As we recall, the stock original was somewhat damaged, but that's not the reason why I replaced it. The reason why I replaced it is because the stock exhaust manifold is actually very, very weak and is one of the weakest parts detail-wise, on these RTR models. This is true for the Tegan, the Henlong, and the Matto. All three of these RTR models feature the exact same exhaust manifold system. Here I have the original exhaust manifold. Now this one here is not from this particular tank. You notice it's yellow instead of gray like the original starter model was, but this is a Tegan exhaust manifold and you get to see exactly why these units are less than ideal. The stock Tegan units are hollow in the back for ease of molding. Now, the way the stock taking units work is that there is a tube that comes out and the smoke just fills up in this cavity over here and then just bellows out from the top. Rather than utilizing that, I went ahead and replaced them with the EastCoastArmory.com resin solid exhaust manifold system. The ECA units are drilled out and because of which the smoke is funneled directly through the system without having it to bellow out in this large cavity that we have over here. Also, the ECA unit has the benefit of better detailing in that first, you don't have this giant cavernous hole found in the side of the manifold, and the top portion does have its better detailing once I zoom in, and you can see what I'm referring to. And here you can see the top sections of the new replaced exhaust manifold. The ECA ones, of course, are solid, so you don't have that giant hole found in the back portions here. And you can also get a glimpse of the puffer cap detailing. The puffer caps are made from flexible resin and are again sold with the sets. You can also acquire them separately in case you just want to do a quick upgrade to an existing Tegan model or a Henlong. Now for the top rain guards that we have here, these are actually from a Tamiya and are left over from a recently completed Tamiya build. The reason why I opted for the Tamiya instead of recycling the Tegan units was that one of the Tegan units was severely damaged during the rebuild process and rather than trying to repair and reconstruct it, I simply just swapped it out for the Tamiya counterpart. Now having said that, these units here are designed to recycle the stock rain guard, rather it being a Henlong, a Matto, or a Tegan. The way this is done is that you keep this, the rain cover itself and you drill out the section that has the molded in fasteners. The ECA kit supplies you with replacement wire brads which are used for the detailing and for the structure for these two parts here. Because however these units are the Tamiya version that wasn't necessary for this particular build. On the bottom portion of the exhaust takes us to the armor covers. Now the armor covers on this unit here are the stock Tegan units. They were recycled and reincorporated for this build. Now in order to utilize these components, I had to modify them slightly in order for them to mount onto the ECA exhaust stack. 
In addition to some hand fitting, I also went ahead and added some cast texturing to these components, which may or may not be easy to see in this from this camera angle. But another detail that is definitely missing on the stock kit that was an easy addition were the Frankenstein lift bolts. The lift bolts that you see here are again, of course, utilized for a crane to wrap cables around these sections and to hoist them off of the vehicle during maintenance or even during assembly of the tank. The lift bolts here are fabricated out of two small nails, panel board nails specifically, and once added really give that missing bit of detailing that is needed on these models. If we notice on the Tiger One exhaust armor, on the heat shields I should say, there, there is a small little section that triangles out from this portion over here. The purpose of this cutout, like I say in many of my 1.6 scale Tiger One videos, is for the clearance of these lift bolts that we have here. So if you ever want to know where exactly to fit them on your model, just put the heat shield over and you'll have a good idea. From there brings us to the rear starter plate. The starter plate is the kit original unit, but was modified in which it is mounted to the vehicle. Hopefully with this camera angle, you get a better idea on what I'm referring to. Now on the 116th models, and this is true for the Henlong and the Tamiya as well, the unit is held in place with four lugs. On the actual Tiger One, there are only two lugs that are found and support the unit to the vehicle. On the model here, the original four units were deleted. And to mount it on, I drilled out the two small integrally molded fasteners that are found on the plate. With two wire brads inserted, this gives you the look of the correct number of mounting bosses. And it gives you a nice strong mounting and the piece will not fall off while the model is in operation. In addition to this, there were some holes that were found on the rear section here for the exhaust mounting as well as also for the starter plate mounting. These sections need to have been plugged up with the bodywork and then once the bodywork was done, the Zemmerit coating was then blended in. Moving from the starter plate now brings us to the rear jack. The jack that we have here is the resin set from EastCoastArmory.com and simply just dropped into place where the kit unit would have went. Moving towards the front brings us to the track removal cable which is found here on the left hand side of the vehicle. This is a staple of detailing on Tiger Ones. However, on this model here some changes need to have been made. The Tiger One had two patterns of track removal cables. The first pattern is the early unit and that is the version that is found on all of the 116 scale Tigers on the market because they all basically trace their roots back to the Tamiya early production kit. The late production units were different in their overall shape. Now the unit that we have here was fabricated and scratch built and in fact I have a tutorial video on how I fabricated and installed this entire system and it's found on the ECA channel. I strongly recommend checking it out for anyone that has a late production Tiger and wants to improve the accuracy and the detail of it by adding the correct pattern of tow cable. In a nutshell the cable itself is fabricated out of a real metal cable and the clips that we have here are steel strips that are soldered together to ensure strength. You need to have these pieces made out of metal because not only is the tank of course radio controlled and it has to deal with the rigors of RC running but with the added tension of the actual metal cable itself just small little plastic pieces that are surf superficially glued to the model surface are just not going to cut it. Now in addition to fabricating all of this you also have to do body work on this section over here. When the model is stock remember we have the kit original plastic track removal cable. When you remove this section you will have sections exposed on the side of the hull where this cable system was present and where it plugged into the plastic hull. These holes need to be deleted and plugged up with the bodywork. Now because this tank does have a coat of Zemerite on it, blending in the bodywork is actually fairly simple. From the side brings us to the front of the vehicle and the front is basically left stock. Some mods that I made had to do with actually the underside here of the front mud flaps. The underbelly had some injection pin marks and on this model here I simply just deleted them with the bodywork. The same exact procedure was also done on the rear mud flaps as well. Now moving from the front area brings us to the front hatch area. Now because it's a late production Tiger One, the position and the layout of the Top Deck Pioneer tools is going to be different compared to the earlier renditions of the Tiger One.
Now on the Tegan model, the tools are actually in the early production format because again, the vehicles are just modified versions of their early production Tigers that are again basically based and copied off the Henlong and the Tamiya. On the model here, first thing I did when I did the teardown was I deleted all of the molded in tools. This will require a little bit of body work to accomplish because the tools are hollow in their moldings and once deleted specifically with the shovel and the axe and the, and the sledgehammer, you will have some sections of hull that need to be rebuilt and plated over with the bodywork. Once everything is sanded down and smooth, I then was able to fabricate the new tools and mount them into their appropriate locations. Now the tools that we have here are actually from a Henlong runner. More specifically, these tools are from the King Tiger set, which you can actually purchase the runners off of AliExpress. They're very affordable and are nicely detailed. They simply just drop directly onto their locations and the installation was complete. One bit of detailing that was supplied with the Tegan kit though is the large C-clamp that we have here. The C-clamp was retained and was remounted back into its appropriate location after the paint and the camouflage was added. Another bit of detailing that was not part of the original sets has to do with this crowbar that we have over here. This crowbar is missing on the Henlong runner and this unit here I had on stock in a parts bag. The piece was actually the crowbar from the Panzer III and Panzer IV sets that are sold by Tegan. They are made of die cast and to mount them to the model I actually have to modify the crowbar. If you try to just mount something like this to the model itself with just adhesives alone, this is not exactly going to work out very well because the piece will eventually want to fall off. The way I permanently mounted this was on a drill press. I drilled a very small hole into the die cast metal, inserted a pin and then the pin was able to be mounted to the vehicle via a matching hole found on the top deck. This gives you a nice strong securing mounting. Another bit of detailing that is missing on all of the ready to run models on the market has to do with the front center blower. The blower detailing that we have here is the ECA resin set and again it just drops directly onto the piece. Also on the front you'll see a well bead on the front and there's also a matching weld bead on the back. Like I frequently mention on these Tiger One builds is that the Tiger One top deck was actually comprised of two plates and they were welded directly in the center. This weld bead detailing is missing on just about all of the 116 scale kits on the market as well as most of the 135th scale kits on the market for that matter. By adding and sculpting in this missing piece of detailing also helps the look of the model. Some other details on the front to talk about are these three holes that we have here on the hatch and also on the top deck. On the real vehicle, these small flush mounted holes are actually for the fasteners that bolt the hinge to the hatch and also to the top deck. They are found on both sides and are a mirror image. While on the front, you can see that the hatches do open on the Tegan models, which is an improvement from the Henlong. And inside here we have the tank's recharge jack. When I need to recharge the tank, I don't have to take the model apart. I just go in here with a tweezer, pluck out the recharge jack, and that allows me then to charge up the model. Once done, the cord gets stuffed back into place, hatch is closed, and I can then start running the vehicle. On this side here, on the driver's side, we have the fuel filling spout to refill the smoke fluid system, again, remotely, where you don't have to try to squeeze the smoke fluid reservoir tube down all the detailing that I added and mentioned previously. Moving away to the back, here you can see the other portion of the weld bead that I mentioned earlier. From the weld bead, this now brings us to the tank's engine hatch. Now the engine hatch on the model has been modified, making it more accurate for a late production Tiger. Since again, the top deck was really, again, the early production Tiger's tooling, on the engine hatch, you still had some of the provisions for the FIFO mounting tubes, and you also had the original large air intake for the early production Tiger. The air intake was deleted, and in its place is the late pattern version, which is from EastCoastArmory.com. The FIFO mounting equipment has been deleted, and all remembrance have been polished away with bodywork. 
Moving from the engine hatch now takes us to the tank's grill work. Now the grill work on the model is the stock unit but has been modified giving it a little bit more detailing. First and foremost, the grill sections, if you notice on this grill over here, several of the sections that made contact with the box frame were segmented and cut out. Same were, can also be said to the main fan grills themselves. This is true for Tiger 1s like I've just mentioned in a 1-6 scale Tiger 1 video as well as the other Tiger 1 videos that I frequently post. The Tiger 1 had its grill work segmented in a certain pattern and once made to the model greatly helps improve the accuracy and look. Now you'll notice that on this model here there is grenade grill covers that have been added. These are photo wetch additions that are also found on Tegan's website. The pieces are nicely made in photo wetch and simply mount directly to the vehicle without any problems. I strongly recommend these sets for anyone who wants to upgrade their 116 Tiger 1 as these sets here will work on all Tiger 1s on the market from the Tamiya to the Mato to even the Henlong. From the grills, this now brings us to the fire extinguisher. This unit here was not supplied with the stock Tegan kit, nor is it found with the other Ready Run kits on the market. The one that we have here is actually, again, from the King Tiger Detail Runner and was mounted directly in place. The King Tiger and Tiger 1 utilize the exact same fire extinguisher. Now, one thing to point out that is a mistake on the Tegan model, as well as the other RTR models on the market, has to do with the secondary antenna storage tube. For some reason, Henlong decided to have a duplicate antenna storage tube mounted in this section over here. Now, on the Tiger 1, the antenna storage tube, of course, is located in this section. And this unit here is the integrally molded-in unit. For some weird reason, Henlong decided to duplicate this detailing and mount it over here. Well, this is inaccurate and it is still found on the Tega models. This, to accurize the model, the secondary antenna tube is deleted and is polished away, leaving for the appearance that we have here, which immensely, in my opinion, improves the accuracy of one of these RTR models. Moving towards the sides of the vehicle, you can see here the section of the turret armored ring guard. Now the armored ring guard is a bit of detailing which is exclusively found on these later pattern Tiger 1s. The purpose of this guard here is to protect the turret neck from any sort of projectile that could get wedged in here jamming the turret. Believe it or not this is something that can and did happen. If you want to look for an example look no further than the Bobbington Tiger 131. That tank was actually disabled by an anti-tank round wedging itself and jamming the turret preventing it from moving. One of the ways the engineers went to thwart this issue was to create an armored collar neck. These pieces here would be bolted to the top deck of the Tiger 1 and this piece here is a resin set from EastCoastArmory.com. It consists of a single resin casting that gets mounted directly to the top deck of the vehicle. Now while on this section here another thing to point out has to do with some of the other accessories that are integrally molded to the top deck which are carryovers from the early production Tiger 1 tooling. This has to do with the S-Mine launcher mount as well as the snorkel cover cap which is located in this section of the vehicle. These again are only found on early production units and for a late pattern these would not be appropriate. The little brackets are deleted with a Dremel and polished away with the bodywork and some sandpaper. Same thing was also done with the snorkel cover cap plate as well. Now the kit does supply you with some S mines to be mounted to the sides of the hull. However, these are, even though they are a nice gesture, are completely inaccurate for a late production Tiger 1 that we have here. And those features are only exclusively found on early production units. On the opposite side of the top deck takes us to the tank's antenna base. Now the antenna base that we have here is not the original molded in one. That unit was deleted and in its place I replaced it with a 3D printed component from EastCoastArmory.com. The ECA one does have better detailing compared to the stock molded in unit which has the detailing for both the rubber insulator itself as well as the brass mounting hardware for the antenna wire. All this is an integrally 3D printed unit and drops directly onto the stock vehicle. 
Moving our way to the tanks, turret first takes us to the side turret visors. Now the visors are integrally molded into the model and are covered with the Zemerit coating vinyl sides that I mentioned earlier. One modification that I recommend though has to do with the addition of this small little slit. With the Zemerit add-on, the slit is not present and the piece is just basically caked over. With a Dremel and a cutting stone, I simply just cut into the material, giving you the slit detailing that we have here. And of course, this is a mirror image on the opposite side of the model. Moving from the slit now takes us to the spare tracks. The spare tracks on the model here are the stock Tegan units that come with the model and are decently rendered and detailed out of the box. Some modifications that I made was that first the sinkholes, or I should say the injection pin marks found on the molding of the plastic links were deleted with some bodywork and polished smooth. Also, on the top portions of the retaining clips, you'll see small little handles that have been added. These are found on the real Tiger One and help you have a little bit more leverage when it comes to opening these units. These little bits of detailing are absent on the model and were fabricated out of thin little pieces of wire and also by drilling small holes into the appropriate locations on the hinge. These were also done on the opposite side and once done, really make the model pop a little bit more. From here it takes us to the pistol port and the pistol port detailing we have here is the late production pistol port. This of course differs from the earlier units which was a large drum style system with several fasteners on it. Now on the stock Tegan model there is absolutely no pistol port present which is not necessarily inaccurate it just depends on the vehicle that you're building. Some Tiger 1s throughout the mid and late period were absent any sort of pistol port whatsoever and other units like this model here has the smaller plug type design. This design was a lot simpler compared to the larger unit with that little pivot hinge on the inside and this one was literally just a plug held on with a chain. You would pop it off and then you could stick your P38 out or an MP40 and take care of any business that needs to be addressed. The unit that we have here is a resin casting again found on the East Coast Armory.com product line and it's just a drop in installation to one of these models. From the pistol port now brings us to the vehicle's rear bustle bin. The bustle bin is the stock unit but was modified with having its fastener rivet detailing added to the sides here and also along the back section. These fasteners were added via sewing pins and a pin vise with a whole lot of patience. Once everything is marked the pin vise was used to drill everything out and then the pins were then added. It is a mirror image on the opposite side and note this little section over here where we have this gapped type row. This is exactly as per the real vehicle. On the inner portion here of the bustle bin now takes us to the third lift lug. Now the lift lug is found on the Tegan models. However, the detailing is very simplistic. It is just the lift lug section missing the mounting boss base. The unit that we have here is the set from EastCoastArmory.com and is just a direct replacement for the Tegan set. You just pop off the Tegan unit and drop in the ECA rest and casting. Now from the turret sides now brings us to the turret roof. Now this is the one portion of the entire late production Tiger build that does require the most amount of work. First and foremost it's the top roof. The roof found on the stock Tegan unit is just, again, a early production Tiger with these late production Tiger fittings that have been mounted. On the real late production Tiger 1, one of the key distinguishing factors of one of these vehicles has to do with the thicker panels added to the roof. This has to do with added protection from fighter bombers, which of course by this time of the war was a pressing issue for these vehicles. What was done was at the factory, two new turret plates were added to the existing steel plates found on the roof of the vehicle. We have here a plate in the front and a, another plate in the back. They are welded in the center portion that we have right over here. Now the plates that we have on this model are added and they are comprised of eighth of an inch Lexan sheets. They were cut via templates that I have to fit directly onto the taken roof thus giving you the detailing of the armor plate. The weld beads were all sculpted as of course they would be present on the real vehicle. Now the detailing such as the periscope, the commander's cupola, as well as the center blower here and even the close quarter 
fighting device. All of these units are the stock Tegan sets, and before the installation of the roof, these units were popped off of the stock, the stock deck and then remounted after the new deck was plated over. When it comes to the front portion here, one bit of detailing to point out has to do with the small little holes that we have here again on the top deck. These holes are found on all Tiger 1s and just like with the bow hatches are flush fitting fasteners that are used to mount equipment on the inside of the vehicle. Even with the extra armor added on the top deck, these flush mounted fasteners are still present and are found also on the earlier production units minus the armor roof. From the flush mounting fasteners takes us to the loader's optic. The optic that we have here, again, the guard is the stock taken unit and was mounted, of course, with some sculpted weld beads. On the inside, I actually added some periscope detailing. Unfortunately, it's probably going to be really hard to get into framing with this light, but you can probably see the silhouette here from the angle I had. The periscope detailing was added and of course fills in that missing bit of detailing that is not present on the stock taken unit. On the back section here we have the close quarter defense weapon. This of course is the reason why there's no longer a need for external S mines that I mentioned before as this unit can transverse and launch S mine grenades as well as also smoke grenades as well. Now the unit, the detailing on the piece itself is pretty good which is why I kept the stock unit. If you notice on the roof, there is a star pattern of again the same flush mounted fasteners to mount this to the vehicle. Now another thing to point out is that on the stock Tegan unit, they simply mount this component onto the section which would have been used for the air blower which is found on the early production Tigers. As we recall, the air blower is mounted right here in the corner. Well when the air blower was moved to the center portion of the vehicle, this section here was then devoted to the close quarter weapon, but the weapon is not mounted in the exact same location as the original blower. So that's a mistake found on the Tegan model. And again, it was just a way for Tegan to recycle the early production Tiger 1 casting and giving you the detail by just dropping it into the place where the blower would have been. Now the blower itself is a, this unit here is the late production unit and is the Tegan system and was mounted as is with no mods necessary with the exception of some sculpted well beads. From the blower now takes us to the loader hatch. Now this is one section of detailing which needs to have been completely replaced. The stock Tegan kit utilizes the early production Tiger 1 loader hatch for this system. However, the late production Tiger utilized a new design. The design found on the late production Tiger was the same pattern of loader's hatch which was utilized on the King Tiger. The unit that we have here is actually a 3D printed component found on shapeways.com. The link to specifically this part here is found in the video description below. This exact same hatch I utilize on another Tegan late production Tiger 1 build and it is highly recommended as it was during that build as well. The hatch is nicely shaped, it does have its appropriate angles to it. What was added was a coat of some cast texturing and of course the handle was a piece of wire that was mounted to two integrally printed holes that are found on the printing. Also this center fastener, or I should say the center key locking hole which is found here on the hatch was also added by myself. The cast texturing like I said was added before because the piece is cast on the real unit and the texturing is just not present on the printing. The piece is fully functional and just like on the original model, this is the Airsoft BB kill switch which we have here and this was left completely untouched. Moving from the loader's hatch now brings us to the tank commander's low profile cupola. Now the cupola on this model here is the stock unit but has been modified in order to make it more accurate. First and foremost, the number one feature that needs to have been done had to do with the height of the piece. If we look at the stock cupola, now this one here is a Tegan diecast version. You'll notice that the neck portion protrudes a lot off of the turret roof. Compare that to the unit that I modified, you'll see how much lower I had to make this piece. The reason why the Tegan units are inaccurate has to do again with the way they need to mount to the stock kit turret. 
Like I said before, the stock kit turret on the Henlong and Tegan base vehicles is nothing more than a early production Tiger One casting that has been shoehorned into making a late production unit. If you look at one of those units that are stock, you'll see that for the Commander's Cupola, there is an internal molded-in ring section to mount on the early drum cupola. Because of that, you need to have this extra neck here in order to make it fit properly with that piece. This is at the expense of accuracy because these Commander Cupolas were very low in profile, thus the whole point of this design, and by using the stock unit, it's a bit of an eyesore. By lowering the piece, this greatly helps the look of the component immensely. Now, if you look at the sides here, I also went ahead and added the Periscope Detail Inserts. These are, again, resin castings found on EastCoastArmory.com, and they just mount directly to the stock piece. The hatch is still fully operational, and this is, of course, how you load the Airsoft BB gun on the other side. So nothing has changed with that. Now, other details that were added had to do with the hatch stop that we have over here on the front. There is a small little blade that the hatch would rotate, and when it would go back down into its locked point, it, if the hatch is slightly misaligned, it would hit this plate and would nudge it back and guide it to where it needs to be. This little piece of detailing is fabricated out of a thin little piece of strip styrene. Another detail that was added was this little lug here, which would be for a umbrella that would clip into this section and give some sunshade for the tank commander. Moving along now brings us to the tank commander's MG34T machine gun. Now, the machine gun mount that we have here is the stock unit from the Tegan and was just recycled. The machine gun, however, is different. The stock taking kit supplies you with an MG42 machine gun for this purpose. However, this is inaccurate as the Germans never utilized the MG42 for tank anti-aircraft roles. It was always the MG34T. More specifically, this would have been the MG34 which would have been located in the tank's coaxial position that I'll get to a little later. The MG34T that we have here is again from the King Tiger Henlong accessory runner that I mentioned before about the tools and also the fire extinguisher. In the video description below I have a link to the AliExpress page where they have the runner for sale in which you can purchase it. I strongly recommend getting that runner if anyone's deciding on upgrading one of these late production Tiger ones as it gives you basically all of the missing details in order to fully upgrade one of these taken late tanks. The gun itself is basically detailed. The stock shape is slightly off, however, for the purposes of this build here, this machine gun is perfectly fine for the detail that I'm looking for. Of course, the muzzle end is drilled out because that is a common feature that is done on my build as well. Last bit of detailing to discuss has to do with these three little bosses that we have here on the roof. These are found on the late production Tigers and the purpose for which are to erect a small little crane for, I believe, removing the engine or the engine hatch plate that we have on the back. Moving our way to the mantlet of the model, the mantlet is the stock unit. The only mods that I made superficially are the addition of the missing Zember coating, which is on the front and the sides and even on the bottom of the piece. Also, we have here the tank's coaxial machine gun. Now, the coaxial machine gun that we have here is a bit of detailing, but it also serves a function. One common thing that is found on these radar run models is that in this section over here, there is an LED which is used to signify that the airsoft gun is shooting. Now, the LED protrudes from the gun mandolin and is a bit of an eyesore and does hurt the look of the model. However, a little while ago, I developed this drop-in installation piece where it gives you the detailing of the coaxial machine gun, but it is drilled out and is actually an adapter for the LED. On the inside portion of the turret, the LED gets mounted to this resin piece, and then this resin piece gets mounted to the mantlet. This gives you the detailing fidelity of the MG34T barrel, but it still gives you the indicator light for the LED firing. Now, while on the coaxial machine gun, I want to point out is that, like I said before, the vehicle has an anti-aircraft gun mounted on the top portion of the turret. 
This is technically incorrect on this build. One thing about the German tanks is that unlike the Americans in which they had a coaxial M1919 on the inside of the tank, and on the exterior they had an M2 HB 50 caliber machine gun, for the Germans that wasn't the case. The Germans utilized the coaxial MG34T when the tank would be entering into battle. When the tank was not in battle and was actually just parked or in a rear area, the vehicle's gun would be removed from the mounts on the mantlet, a buttstock would be clipped in place, and the gun would be affixed to the gun mount found on the tank's commander's cupola. The gun, when it's mounted on the outside, is purely for defense of the tank when it's not in battle, either from air cover or from any infantry that might stumble upon the vehicle. When the vehicle would be entering into battle, the machine gun would be removed off of the top of the turret and remounted back in the coaxial position. If anyone has any questions on how this is actually done, in my 222 video I actually have a real MG34 and I describe how this system would actually work. From the coax, this now takes us to the barrel recoiling sleeve. The protector sleeve, again, is the stock unit, but like on all Tiger ones, I add these small little holes in these two sections over here. The holes are for small little fasteners which mount on the bushing that keeps the barrel nice and aligned. On the Tiger one, there are these little fasteners in three locations. We have two on this side, two more on the opposite side, and then there's two more in the direct center lower portion of the sleeve. These three locations are present and drilled on this model here. Final bit of detailing to talk about is that of the gun muzzle. Now, the gun muzzle is the stock Tagen unit, and what is nice is that on the Tagen vehicles, the gun muzzle for the late Tiger is a later pattern compared to the early pattern of vehicle. The difference, of course, being that the early Tiger one utilized a much larger gun muzzle brake compared to its later counterparts. Now, the only detailing that was changed and added has to do with the small little retention nut and plate that we have here in the back. This was fabricated out of a wire brad and a small little piece of plastic. From the gun muzzle brake, this now takes us to the paint and the markings. Now, this is one aspect of the build that I had planned out since the onset. I really like the look of this model, and I specifically wanted to make this vehicle number 312. For many, many years, I always encountered color illustrations of this particular vehicle, as well as also seeing several built examples on the internet floating around throughout the years. After completing my last late production Tiger One, I had the idea that my next Tiger One build was going to be specifically 312. And the only thing I needed was a late production Tagen Tiger One to fall into my lap. A few months later, one popped up on the scratch and dent section and I pulled the trigger on it. Now there are a few different ways I've seen this model rendered. I've seen this tank with yellow and green, yellow and brown, and even three-tone camo. I've also seen several different options for barrel colors, from the primer gray that we have here, to even, again, just full camouflage like the rest of the vehicle. Now the version of Tiger number 312 that really stuck out to me and was the one that I really liked seeing the most was the way you see it rendered here, which consists of a dual tone camouflage pattern of Dunkel Gelb and Dunkel Brun. And then the most striking part of this entire tank that really makes it worthwhile has to do with the turret. Starting with the barrel, the barrel I left with the all German dark primer gray as it really makes it stand out from just your average run-of-the-mill garden variety painted barrel. In addition to the dark gray barrel, the next part that really stands out to me, of course, is this band that we have over here. Unlike the other Tiger ones, which utilize the numbers found on the side of the turret in a multitude of different colors and strokes, which are really cool, but Tiger 312 is really striking in the way that they have a nice big yellow band right on the barrel recoil sleeve with the number pronounced right there dead center. Now as cool and as eye-catching as the yellow band is, the next thing that's really awesome about this vehicle has to do with the unit marking. The Charging Knight is probably one of my favorite 
German unit markings of the war, and it's actually still used today. The, there's some leopards that actually retain this symbol. Now, with combination of the Charging Knight, the 312 in the yellow band, and the gray barrel, this vehicle to me just all ties it up together, and it really makes for a nice piece. Which is why this vehicle needs to be a late production Tiger with the Zemrit coating. And this is why the Tegan starter model is absolutely perfect as a starting point in order to build this rendition of the Tiger One. Now in a very interesting turn of fate, one particular reason that this build was all that much more easier to render had to do with the markings. Now the markings for 312 are a water slide decal set from Hussar Productions. The Hussar decals are exquisitely made as high as quality as you can imagine. They went on with absolutely no problems, they lacquered on just as easily, and have a very nice flat matte finish that you can see here on the markings. Now, what's so cool about these markings is that they not only give you the markings for Tiger number 312, but they also give you a boat load of markings for a number of Tiger 1s. With the one decal sheet that they supply you with, you can literally build every single Tiger that is on this little booklet. And it's literally a booklet of different variants of the Tiger 1 to build. I cannot recommend these decals enough, and with the amount of decals I still have left on hand, it's not too surprising that I may have a few of these builds come across this desk at some point in the future.